Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Stacey Bellward, the host of the Connected Families podcast. Welcome to our community. We are people committed to pursuing God's grace and truth for ourselves and then daily working to pass that grace and truth on to our children. I'm so glad that you are here today. You know, in today's podcast, it's going to feel a little bit different. I'm excited. We gathered an all-star group of dads to have a heartfelt conversation about what being a safe parent looks like, what the Bible says about it, and then share practical stories. So listen in as Jim Jackson, co-founder of Connected Families, Chad Hange, director of education and equipping, and Alan Thetford, certified parent coach and coach trainer for Connected Families, all have a conversation. Well, welcome to the Connected Families podcast. My name is Chad Hange, and if you were expecting to hear Stacy Bellward's voice, uh uh-uh. uh no, we've got a little surprise for you today. This is a uh, this is a dad's only podcast, and uh, I am really happy to introduce to you a couple of guests that are going to join me. Jim Jackson, who is the co-founder of Connected Families, along with his wife, Lynn, is here. Hey, Jim, welcome. Hey, Chad. It's good to be here. Good to be with you this way again. Yeah. We also have Alan Thetford, who is uh, joining us as well. And uh, Alan is a certified parent coach through Connected Families, then also has kind of moved forward in uh, doing some training now and helping us train other uh, parent coaches along with his uh, wife, Corey. And um, so really glad that you're here, Alan. Thanks for joining us on the on the podcast. Glad to be he's here. Got, he's got some kids that are going to put the ideas we talk about today to the to the lit. He's going to like, for real? I, I got four kids. That's not going to work, Chad. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, that's that's why it's like, well, you and I are here working from from our own experience and yeah. some theory practice. Of course, we had a lot of practice, but uh, not the day in, day out. So we're really glad. Alan, that you uh, said that you would be willing to to join us for this podcast. So just to also to let you know that Alan and Jim and I were golfing together in Texas, 80 degrees. Oh, the Northerners in February are not used to 80 degrees. So anyway, that was uh, that was a blast uh, to be able to share space with, with each of you as well. But we're going to talk today about... Uh, what it looks like to be an emotionally safe parent, and in particular, an emotionally safe dad. And uh, that is a concept that uh, I I think for for me and maybe for both of you as well, wasn't something that that was on the radar for me. (laughs) I never heard that term before when I was a dad. What's that? And I remember when Linwood confront me or address like, Jim, don't you think that's a little harsh? I'd be like, you know, these kids just need to know. They just need to know. And this is how yeah. it's going to be. And well, yeah, but you're scaring them. Nah, I mean, maybe for a little bit, but that's okay. Yeah. Well, isn't the scaring part, I mean, builds some respect and it builds some fear of uh, the parent and and me as dad. So that kind of is a, a good thing, I would think, right? But then she asked me this question that stuck with me ever since. And it's it's really been a guide for me. It's like, well, it's one thing for them to respect you, but if it, but it's another thing for them to want to run away from you or be afraid of you or not want to be with you. And I began to notice, especially with my oldest, that he was creating distance between him and me and and kind of running away and hiding. He was like he would hide his trouble from me. And I and she's like, don't don't you want him to come to you with the troubles of his life and not feel unsafe? That was a turning point for me. Like, man, I want to do a better job of running my good intentions of building building respect in my kids through the lens of their experience of me. Because just because I have the good intention and do it a certain way, you know, if you turn a camera on me when my daughter is going in the refrigerator before dinner when she's not supposed to be there and I'm snapping and I'm, you know, I'm not raising my voice super loud or anything. And she looks at me and says, dad, stop yelling at me. You're always yelling at me. And then she cries yeah. and runs away. And I'm like, man, well, she's just weak. She's got to get tougher. Yes. But if I'd have seen that interaction through a camera, and not seeing the daughter and not even knowing who was there, I don't think I would have deemed that a safe interaction. Like, no, that's that's not the kind of interaction that endears a person toward my teaching. And so I, I had a wake up call back then about viewing what was going on more through my kids' lens, not for the purpose of just making life easy for them and not for the purpose of maybe backing away from some firmness from time to time, but for the purpose of assessing Am I being the dad I want to be right now on the way to earning my kids trust? Yeah. I think trust is the fruit of safety. And if our kids don't trust us, 
then we probably in some shape or fashion have not been safe with them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're bringing up some good pieces here. I think looking for a, like definition and, and it's it's hard to wrap your hands maybe around like what is an emotionally safe parent or, or dad, but I think you named some elements there. Alan, are there aspects of that that you would add? Like, like how would you know if you were emotionally safe? Like what are some key components? Yeah. It's helpful for me to kind of go the other way and say, what is, what is not emotionally safe? And so I noticed that my kids would run away from me in conflict or, or they would they would kind of tense up, like prepare for me to yell or, or however I would react. And so I, I think that was not not emotionally safe. So I, I would say emotionally safe is are my kids free to have emotions without without me bringing my own emotions into it or my own identity into it? Can, can they have the safety to just feel things and then me guide them through it without bringing my own emotions into it? Wow. So that's that's an interesting concept, I think, for dads in particular is can they have their own emotions? Like, can I be OK with them having emotions that are different or maybe even uncomfortable for me? Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, I think so. I think for me, I'll speak for me personally, I would see emotions and project it out 16 years into the future. Oh. And so if if my if my 16 year old screams when she gets hurt like this, it's not going to go well. So I got to stop it now. Or if my 16 year old gets angry and hits, then he might go to jail. So I got to stop this now. And so, yeah, all those emotions, I don't even know if I would say that, that the emotions themselves are uncomfortable, but, but part of it is just me bringing my own baggage into it of, of yeah. worry about the future or, or worry about the things that, that I've seen, just my own baggage. I guess I want to highlight there too, is that your intentions were really good. Yeah. That is, I, th I think it's important for us as dads to, to go, wait, those are good things. We don't want our kids reacting or responding like that, or there are serious implications if they do. And so we're going to nip that in the bud, right? It's like, no, we've got to stop that. Yeah. I think it's an important one. I felt like initially for me as a dad, like I was getting maybe the 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 sense that that I was bad or wrong based on my approach without anybody ever affirming that the intentions were actually really good ones it was then what was the fruit of you know the likelihood of that and you were just talking about parenting maybe from a place of fear or anxiety of the future and so I know for me when I end up in that space I tend to become far more controlling because I don't want to see that bad stuff happen yeah. And Chad, I think you touch on something that at least for me was important, which is I'm not sure I even knew how to think about or experience my own emotions. I, they were there. And the way that I would, I, I learned over time to confess that the way that I would cope with the emotions that I was feeling of, of anxiety about the future or of feeling disrespected or frustration, like I, I had all these emotions. And instead of saying, you know what, I'm feeling a little afraid of the future right now and I'm feeling a little frustrated. And so I'm going to set those aside and respond wisely to my child here. Those emotions would just fuel me to take control of a situation in order to make those emotions go away. Like I don't like those emotions. I don't like how they feel. I don't want to have to do the hard work to dig them up and figure them out and then make a choice about what to do. I, I just want to control the situation right now so that we can get on with life and so that these kids can learn respect and so that these kids can learn to do what's right or wrong. And so, you know, a child would be whining about this or that or the other thing. Well, behind whining are some feelings. I have an opportunity right here to validate some feelings or I have an opportunity here to, to say, you know, you need to buck up. This is the way life works and move on with things. Well, if that's what I do, and there's a, there's an element of truth to, to that. Like our kids, I think for their own good long-term do need to deal with difficult emotions in a way that, that they don't just stop and spend lots of time whining and they move on to do the difficult things. Like that's an important life skill to learn. So that's all good stuff. But if I don't acknowledge in the middle of all of that, A, my own emotions or B, my child's emotions in a way that feels validating or supportive, then I, then I minimize them. And when I don't pay attention to my child's feelings and I just try to squish them in the name of moving on or controlling a situation, I communicate a message to my child that they don't matter, that they're not important, that what's, that what's important to them is less important than what's important to me right now. And it's a diminished human sort of status that I communicate to my kids. And then, you know, either out of weakness, you know, or fear, they'll comply with what I ask them to do from now on. And I'll think that my parenting is working, 
you know, or B, they'll just get more and more rebellious over time. And that's usually A happens first, compliance, and then they get tired of it and they start to rebel and become more difficult. And then when they hit 12 or 13 and maybe 11, and they're starting to develop their own personal power, you know, they'll they'll just get all rebellious, like, and I'll wonder what happened all of a sudden. Yeah. But yeah. that didn't happen all of a sudden. That happened over years of me squelching my kids' emotions and not being an emotionally safe parent. That's a really good insight because I think we end up then either having kind of the Pharisee who follows the rules as a child. They get their value from their goodness and their right behavior. Or we've got the rebel who says, forget this, I'm done with it. I want nothing to, to do with this. And And I think it's right in that as we see our kids start to shift and change a little bit. We think it happened suddenly, but those glares that we're getting early on, or, you know, there, I think there are, there are tip-offs and cues here that kind of allow us to see that that might be happening sooner than we might have expected. Alan, what, what was it like for you as you started to dip your toe into the emotional safety side of things? Yeah, well, it was hard. Like I said, I, I had just fear and anxiety about the future. And so I would try to squash emotions as I grew more aware of what was happening, I, I would try to be emotionally safe. I would try to try to pay attention to my my posture or what my face looked like. And I would try to put on a smile. One of my daughters during a particularly tense situation, she said, Daddy, you're doing that fake smile again. I can tell you're really angry inside. So so it 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 takes a lot of a lot of practice, a lot of like what Jim said. It takes a lot of time to deal with those emotions and figure out what's going on in me, what's making me respond this way. And then one of my other daughters, just a couple of nights ago, we were we were having a little bit of a bedtime struggle, and she she blurted out, "Daddy, you interrupted me." And and so it was like her signal, "Hey, you're not safe right now. I can tell that that you're not listening. You're not hearing me. It's still a work in progress. I'm still growing in it, but it it takes a lot of time." But the the feeling safe enough to say, "Hey, you're interrupting me," believing that you would be able to receive that and alter your approach, maybe a little bit, is that maybe a, a form of safety in in that situation? Yeah, I think so. I think the work that I have done doesn't mean I've got it figured out, but the work that I have done so far has communicated to my kids, "Hey, there's some re- receptivity here. There's some humility in yeah. Daddy that we can communicate together and and work as a team. He's not going to make it all about himself." And, and shut me down. So this is a, such a good conversation and I appreciate uh, both of your insights here. We're going to take a, a quick break and uh, we'll come back on the other side of the break and pick up maybe a little bit more about what are we what are we going to do here? How do we want to grow in this area as well as where's this biblical piece for this safety thing that we're talking about? So we'll see you on the other side. Do you love yourself a good cheat sheet? Or have you ever purchased a short form book? You know, the very abbreviated version of the longer nonfiction book. Well, I confess, I am a huge fan of reading and books. I've got a bunch of them, but I have purchased a short form book before. (laughs) Well, if you do like that kind of thing, I think you're going to love the new product that our team put together. We put together a set of cards that gives a digestible summary of our 11 core teaching tools. It's called the Connected Families Quick Guide for Parenting. It gives simple, practical reminders of the Connected Families Toolbox. Each card is a different tool. You could keep these 11 cards in a diaper bag or your mom bag or the car side pocket or maybe even on your kitchen window sill. (laughs) Okay, you get it. And you might need more than one, right? They're less than $10. Tap through to the show notes. You can find them. But these cards are really handy when you need reminders about the gifts gone awry or do-overs, the ABCs of affirmation or restorative consequences. There's more. You know, the quick guide will help you to remember what you learned in our online courses on this podcast, or maybe in your coaching sessions. They're designed super cute and readable. So you can glance through and remember the points and how to use that tool when you need it. I love that. We're really glad that you are a part of our community. And we hope that the Connected Families Quick Guide for Parenting Cards will be useful to better equip you to lead your family with grace. The quick guide for parenting cards are on our website, connectedfamilies.org, or you could just tap through to the show notes right now to get your set of cards. Well, 
welcome back again here with uh, Jim Jackson and Alan Thetford. I'm Chad Hange, and we are talking about emotionally safe parenting and what that looks like to be an emotionally safe dad. And before I forget, I want to offer a couple of resources that we have. Uh, they'll be in the show notes. You can take a look at those, but a PDF on uh, calming for parents as well as 50 calming activities for kids. And then we also have a, uh, a PDF that you can take a look at that just talks about kind of a, a covenant to your child about you're safe with me. Like, what are some things that we would want to covenant with our kids about in terms of safety? Uh, for your consideration, I would encourage you to take a look at it and spend some time engaging with those materials. So as we look into, you know, the last few minutes here and these this time just flies by doesn't it but i'd love to just hear a little bit maybe from each of us maybe a 60 90 second synopsis on how did how did the bible inform your movement towards engagement with this idea of becoming emotionally safe how does scripture say and how did that inform each of you jim do you want to take the lead on that you say 90 seconds, Chad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 90. I know that you especially are 90 seconds. You probably okay. take 45, but just see if Jim, you can you use can take 45 with my seconds. <laughs> no, no, no. It's probably a good discipline for me to, to narrow this. But early in our parenting, as I became more and more aware that my good intentions and my kids' perceptions were so different, I really did want to look to the Bible because I was getting a lot of messages about the Bible and the commands about punitive and the rod and being a, you know being stern and taking authority and all those things. And I'm like, I really want to just take a journey through what does this, what do the scriptures say? And Lynn and I discovered, and you may have read about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul describes this parental relationship that he's got with the church. We were like a gentle mother nursing you, caring for you. There's even sort of like we were almost childish with you in some respects. And then, and then we were like, like a father urging you, comforting you, urging you to live lives worthy of God. And I mean, that, that was a starting place for saying, wow, the Apostle Paul called the people he wrote to his children in many places. Let's study how he parented them. And then just through the whole counsel of of that teaching, we, we never once saw anything punitive from, he, Paul could get firm for sure, but he never commanded people to hurt one another, to punish one another. There are some 50 one another statements in the Bible, I believe, and not a single one of them makes any reference at all to punish one another. And then I started thinking, well, our households, our little clans, our little communities are supposed to be little sort of mini representations of what the church is supposed to be like. So let's conduct ourselves under this umbrella of the one another's. So that was one way the Bible informed me. And I just really made the one another's be a source of how I want to be toward my little brothers and sisters, either in Christ or on the way to being in Christ. And then Philippians chapter four has been just a guidepost. And you've probably, if you've listened to me on podcast before, I go to this time and time again. But I learned to read this almost as a parenting instruction for me. I rejoice in the Lord always. Don't be anxious about things. By prayer, petition, present requests to God. And the peace of God that transcends understanding will guard your heart and mind. And then dwell on what's true, what's noble, what's right, what's pure, what's lovely, what's admirable. Think about that stuff. Put that stuff front and center. Give energy to those things. And whatever you have learned or heard in me or seen in me, put it into practice. And again, we don't see Paul taking on a punitive, stern, again, firm and stern to me are two different things. Stern is scary, and I'm going to scare you away by my sternness, and I don't do the Greek here, so the scholars can play with that a little bit. But there's a respectable sort of a firmness, and there's a not respectable sort of a firmness. I'll just say it that way. And I wanted to do more of the respectable kind and less of the not respectable kind, because I came to understand respect is not earned. I mean, it's not a given. Respect is earned, and I wanted my kids to respect me, and through the portal of respect, they would feel safe. Yeah. Well, you, you think about that. Uh, I think it's uh, Philippians 4, I think it's 9, whatever you've seen in me or heard from me, put that into practice. And if that's what we're saying to our kids, hey, whatever you see in me or you hear from me, put that into practice. But that could be a little bit of a uh, an invitation into me looking at what my kids are actually hearing from me and seeing in me. And are they putting it into practice? And if I were to be honest with myself, at, uh, when my kids were much younger, I would say that they were, and I didn't like it as much either. So how about for you, Alan? How did uh, scripture inform your move maybe towards a little bit more on the emotionally safe side of things? 
I would say, so we've already talked about my gift gone awry a little bit, looking into the future, fear and anxiety. So if, if I take the fear and anxiety out of that, uh, sometimes it's really helpful that I can have a vision for how, how these things are going to affect my kids in the future. And so like you're saying, the verse that, that says basically model after me, I want my, I want my sons to learn how to be a husband and a father by watching me. I want my daughters to learn what kind of man they're looking for by watching me. And so as we reflected on, on James 1, 19 through 20, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger doesn't produce the righteous living that God desires. I heard that verse a lot growing up because I was often quick to speak, but it, it, it shifted a little bit uh, that last piece, because human anger doesn't produce the righteous living that God desires. And so, uh, like we talked about at the beginning, I had good intentions. I was trying to produce that righteous living that God desires, but my anger wasn't doing it. And so I often go back to that verse. Okay, am I being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry? That alone is, for me, that's the first step to emotional safety, is just taking that breath and then and then reflecting on that verse. You know, when we start looking at that that through the lens of our our own kids, right? It's like slow to speak. Am I slow to speak or quick to listen? Like I think that that's taught so much in just the adult to adult sort of uh, relationships. But it's it's an it's an imperative for us. It doesn't say just to adults. It says, hey, everyone should be right. And so I appreciate that. I think for me, uh, one of the things that that stood out is the Matthew 12, 12, 34 verse out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mm -hmm. And as I would listen to how I would speak about my kids and my own frustration with them, uh, it became pretty apparent that that um, my heart was not inclined toward them. It was it was an impatient expectation that things go my way. I started to see entitlement kind of creep up in my own life. Like I'm entitled to well-behaved kids who listen all the time, who are respectful all the time. And so it was kind of a work even in my own heart. Like, um, hmm, maybe your kids aren't there to make sure that your life is easy. And when it dawned on me that my kids really didn't have much interest uh, at their young age of making my life easy, like that's not why they were alive. It's like, huh. Right. Okay. Maybe there are some things that need to shift in my own heart, my tone, my attitude, even how they would look at me when I was, well, I wouldn't even say I was angry, but you could just feel the the fear um, and the pulling back from me. I think all all of which kind of played into that. The first John 4, 18, there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. I think fear-based compliance was where I was headed. Like I could get you to do what I want you to do because you're afraid of me, not because you love me, but because you might be more afraid of me. And I want to say a thing here because I've been in interactions recently with people who are putting a lot of weight on sort of the punitive nature of God, especially throughout the Old Testament, and then the wrath of God and the importance of the wrath of God. And Chad, you're talking about this, this nature of love that is so compelling. You know, the Bible teaches us that God is love. And then we are implored as his children over and over and over again to love one another, to, to take on a fashion of love that is an, that emulates the love of the Father for us. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished on us that we would be called his children. But then there is teaching in the Bible, and, and I think we need to take it very seriously about God's wrath, about his intolerance for sin. Strangely, as I look up the commands to us in the Bible about wrath, it becomes actually really clear that God's wrath is for God. God, we're never commanded once to be representatives of God's wrath. You know, there's a time where Paul recommended expelling somebody from the church. Was that about wrath? No, that was about protecting the church from an unrepentant sinner. This was less a punishment to that person than it was an arrangement by which that person was no longer going to be given access to have a negative impact on the, on the community. You know, that's a boundary. It's good to set boundaries. But we are never invited in the scriptures to be representatives of God's wrath. And yeah. that landed just really, really heavily on me early on because I was, in my mind, theologically, it was my job to punish and to be a representative, to teach my kids, you know, that there's a consequence and it's painful if you don't do what I say. When I was honest, I would have to say, Say that the vast majority, if not every time I took on that attitude, it was a cop out that put me in avoidance of doing the hard work of looking inward, taking every thought captive to Christ's obedience, and doing my work to live in the fruit of God's Spirit. 
let's say that there's a dad listening to this podcast, or maybe maybe there's a, a mom hoping that dad listens to the podcast or, but it's like, okay, so you're, you're painting a picture and, and I might even be compelled to, to move toward it, but I don't know how, like what, how would I do this without losing all credibility or all respect? I, my kids might be just running all over me here. You know, Alan, when you think about that, that move from where you were to, to now, I mean, Jim and I were with you and your family recently, and again, the ups and downs and the struggles and all the things and the big emotions, and it was just real life family stuff. But how do you move from that place of where you were and what we've described to, to a much calmer place, a, 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 I think a, a safer place for your kids, for your family? What are some steps to get into that direction or moving in that direction? I came from a similar place that Jim was talking about, about the emphasis on on God's wrath and and my role or my job to to represent that part of God also. I think the the first thing is we aren't saying that our kids don't learn responsibility, that we don't want to hold our kids responsible and help them to grow in wisdom and understand that there are consequences for their actions. So having that end in mind, knowing that knowing that there's still accountability that my kids are going to learn helps me to 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 have some short-term pain for long-term gain. Mm-hmm. And so the short-term pain is my kids, they they know the way that that we used to do it. They know how they're supposed to act. They know how I'm supposed to act. And so when I change what I do, they really would just like to go back in that rut that that we've all been in because that's comfortable. They, they know what's expected there. At first, it was really chaotic and it felt like I was getting run over by a freight train, but it was a lot of conversations about, hey kids, this is how I used to do this. And I'm not that proud of that. And my guess is you're not learning what I want you to learn either. So I'm going to try that a different way. Now we're three years, four years past that, and we can see the fruit of that. But for the first little while, several months, the kids didn't buy in. It was just me modeling over and over. It was God changing my heart and then me having to trust, hey, the long-term vision is that God is going to bless my family through me, through my heart change. And so I'm not focused on my kids' behavior in this short term. I'm focused on me and what's going on in my heart. Yeah. So that's a huge shift to get out of trying to get my kids to change and more into God, do a work in my heart, change my heart in this situation. And I think mm-hmm. that's a really important step to to underscore here. Well, and I want to, I want to go back to a thing I said earlier, just in terms of a practical example. Years ago, my young daughter, you know, everybody in the family knew you don't snack before dinner. But I went in the kitchen and my daughter, seven, six, seven years old, was there sneaking food out of the refrigerator. And I described my response, daddy, stop yelling at me. What we're suggesting safe looks like in that situation isn't, oh, honey, are you hungry? What do you need? That's that's sort of an enabling. That's a whole different conversation. I don't want to go down right now. That's That's permissiveness. We're not talking about permissiveness. What I wish I had done through the lens of safety was, Oh, Bethany, ho, 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 what, what is going on? I get down on her level with a smile. I'm, You're hungry, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm hungry too. We've talked about this a little bit, haven't we? Remember what we said? Remember what you agreed? I'm not supposed to eat before dinner. That's right. You listened. That's amazing. Now let's close the refrigerator and come over here, sit on my lap for a minute, and let's talk about a plan to get you through to dinner. But daddy, I'm so hungry. <laughs> and well, what do you think will happen if you don't eat? Will you will you die? Will you oh, I just don't want to be hungry. Oh, I don't want to be hungry either. How can we go through this together? I don't know. Let's let's do something while we're waiting. And, and it's going to be another 20 minutes. And then what can we do for 20 minutes? Or what can you do for 20 minutes? You see my point here? Yeah. It's I'm feeling yeah. her accountable for not eating out of the refrigerator when she's supposed to. I'm disciplining her firmly by not letting her have the food she wants and not giving in to the whining. But I'm also not getting hooked by her whining and feeling out of control and feeling angry and starting to project these future fears. What if she behaves like this in the future? And this whole thing harkens me to this resource that we're making available today on the, on the podcast. And it's the link about a covenant promise to your child. Like what kind of, what kind of parent do you want to be? And this was written by our executive director, Anna, and it's written in the context of a family form through adoption. But the messages, the sort of the covenant goals of the parent in this document fit us all like child, 
When yeah. my emotions escalate, yours will too, and nobody wins. So I'm going to stay calm and peaceful for you. That's my covenant. I'm going to seek self-control. I'm not going to talk to you about your misbehavior till I have calmed my heart, prayed, and asked God for wisdom. There's the take captive every thought to Christ's obedience stuff. That's my job as a parent. It's all of our jobs as a parent, not just here and there, all the time to be doing this. Child, my relationship with Christ gives me security to handle your anger, rejections, and proclamations, even saying, I hate you. I can be okay when you're struggling. I'm not going to let your struggle define my wellness. And, and the list goes on. Very practical things to be thoughtful about. I encourage you to, to look at the show notes and get that download. Yeah. I, and I think that our time is, is always going too fast here. So we're going to need to wrap up. But I, I do think the having some of those concretes, I love the example, Jim, that you gave. You know, if you're new to the Connected Families framework, we're really talking about the, the message. We talk about four messages that we want our kids to receive from us, even in the struggle and the misbehavior. You're safe with me is what we're really focusing on today. You're loved no matter what. It's the kind of love that God has for us. You're called and you're capable. How do we build skills in our kids? And then you're responsible for your actions. And so how do we bring accountability? And just like that scenario, I appreciate it so much because it gives language to us as parents. Like that, that is not permissive parenting. It does take a little extra time, especially on the front end, as Alan alluded to. It's like, oh my goodness. All right, we're having conversations now. And before I might've pounded the table and say, that's enough. Uh, and it might have stopped right there out of fear. But now we're stepping into a little different space. So I know, Jim, that you, you're you good on your economy of words here. So just any last quick thoughts, Alan, any last quick thoughts that you want to make sure that uh, people walk away with uh, today? I got something, Alan. You got something? I got something. Go ahead. You go, I'll go. <laughs> Me first? We'll, we'll flip a coin yeah. here. Go ahead, Alan. I'll just say, man, it is worth it. From From where our family was four or five years ago and the trajectory that we were on, the the connectedness or the lack of connectedness in our family was much different. And then after the hard work and the continuing work, it's it's not over yet, but we are continuing to just go back to that message of what's going on inside of me, what's going on in my kids, and then and then ho holding them accountable. Man, it is so worth it to to do that hard work. Holding them accountable with grace. Mm -hmm. And this is this really is a nice segue, Alan, to how I would like to finish my time. There was a study a few years back that came out. Lifeway Research did a thing about why kids are leaving church. Why are the young adults leaving church? And, you know, moving, aging, you know, a bunch of different things, but very high on the list of things. So there's stuff out of, out of the grown-ups control, and then there's stuff in the grown-ups control. And one of the highest things on that list of things that are in the grown-ups control is a perceived sense of hypocrisy. My parents, the leaders in the church, are, they say one thing, they put up a message of what it means to follow Jesus, but then they treat me this way or that way, or I watch them treat my friends this way or that way. And I don't want to get into rabbit trails here about the different things that kids are wrestling with these days that require a graceful approach. It's complicated to be sure, but what the kids are saying is hypocrisy is what's leading me away. And I would suggest that one of the biggest antidotes that we can possibly administer in light of that is to recognize our own ability to be hypocrites, our own sin, our own undone work to take thoughts and attitudes and mindsets captive to Christ's obedience as we attempt to do the best we can to parent our kids. And then, you know, you talked about humility, Alan. The last of the covenants on this list says, child, when I mess up, not if I mess up, I will humbly apologize and ask for forgiveness with complete sincerity, and I will take ownership of my own messes. I think when kids see that example, the notion of hypocrisy of parents, which is a high factor in why kids are leaving the church, is going to be weakened, if not eliminated. It might be the most important thing we can do. Do we apologize when we blow it, and do we restore well with our children when we have not been safe? That uh, authenticity, humility, it's like your daughter recognizing, Alan, that that's a fake smile. You're trying hard here, but you're, that's a fake <laughs> smile right smile. now. I know you're angry on the inside. Like, yeah, how do we grow in that and lean into it? So, hey, great conversation. So good to be with both of you. And uh, I trust that this will be an encouragement. And dads, if you're out there and you're thinking, I don't know about this, or you want to get some more support, we've got those resources that we 
uh, suggested. And we also provide some parent coaching. We've got online courses. There are lots of other podcasts and and ways that you can grow in this. Thanks for listening and uh, looking forward to uh, the next time with you guys. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Chad. I apologize humbly for taking more than 90 seconds. (laughs) (laughs) It was was worth it. Thanks for joining, Alan. Thanks, Chad.